I have a question, and I'm not sure if it can help me. It just wouldn't remind you, remind you. Okay. <laughs> just, just in regard to uh, defense and small countries, it seemed to me that a possibility could be contracts, uh, defense contracts with bigger countries, alliances, as well. Uh, 
gave the impression that this was somehow more characteristically European, but uh, I don't think it was very much. Uh, unless I'm wrong, there was probably not much difference. Uh, would you agree or do you think European press was, was even more contentious and neglectful in terms of reporting on false candidacies? Well, um, basically, the, 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 the European press uh, did their best to ignore him, and they had an easier job ignoring him because the Americans um, were, well, you know, the media, media were more or less ignoring him or his family. So for them, it was, uh, well, which one is the most likely, or which ones are the most likely of the Republicans and Democrats? We're going to report about them and the big differences between their uh, issues, which uh, 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 this one called sort of strange, sort of weird things we don't understand that. So it's, it, it, there's a big issue. Uh, there's an extra effort involved in understanding what it's actually talking about, and you've got a, a, a strict timeline, and, and everyone else in the, in the country you're talking about is talking about all the others. It's, there's not much of an incentive to start to talk about uh, this, this weird guy. Um, um, so uh, he was largely ignored. Uh, so, so there may have been a, in a half sentence on a normal legal article. Of um, what 500 words or so, they're half a sentence, so yes, one call was a bit strange. That was it. I mean, you're right. Well, I think just want to, again, with a short comment, a question also. The comment is that, that I can see that, okay, now from the Washington, this is it, okay. But I would like to, kind of to point out the gesture that it was not the United States, so not that one third of the Iranians, or one fifth of the Poles. It was Soviet Union and President of Russian Federation today saying that Soviet Union was the greatest country in the world and everything which it did is very good. So that's why I kind of committed back immediately in his, in his picture, the President of Russian Federation, KGB, Kilmer, who is all covered with, 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 with blood and Miss Smith uh, in, in all this kind of thing. It's like that I'm reading that I'm in the government. By the good reasons, in which he is saying that all the small countries of Europe should have a system of collective defense against the big bullies. He calls the bullies are uh, Russia, Germany, and Italy. For some reason, that was probably was, was uh, created in 1944. But <clears throat> what do you think if, for example, instead of NATO, we would have small countries with a collective, uh, it's questions are ridiculous. Uh, for example, Baltic states and Eastern Europe. Uh, well, this is like about 23 Eastern European countries who have a system, we call it uh, Eastern European Democratic Union. Okay, well, well, I mean, you know, we're awfully tired of hearing about how Putin is, you know, the new style of life. I mean, Russia is demographically shrinking. Okay? You know, the Soviet Union is, is over. And it, I mean, Russia is lucky if it survives into the 22nd century as, as you know, as a as a unitary state. And if you look at what is happening, the West is encircling Russia deliberately as a strategy. Okay, they have NATO. NATO is at the gates of Moscow, number one. Georgia is about to enter NATO. Kyrgyzstan is about to enter NATO. We have bases all around, and every day we have George W. Bush or some neocon in the State Department or elsewhere saying, yes, Russia is backsliding. Well, Russia is not only backsliding, given that they're coming out of how many years of the most oppressive authoritarian government ever. And you know what? I don't think that people personally killed all of the Lithuanians. This is just emotional demagoguery and war And you know, if, if we have a second Cold War, uh, it'll be because well meaning people are mouthing this rhetoric. And, and you know, that's all you're doing. The neocons hate Russia. They, they you know, I mean, and, and, and that is their next goal. They want the oil in, in, in uh, Central Asia. Uh, they want more bases. Uh, and, and that's their agenda. And if you want to sign on to it, well, then you're welcome to it. You're either I want. And I'm very, very surprised because, I mean, we are on the side of literacy. Why do you think Georgians or Ukrainians or Ukrainians wanted to join NATO? And because they were the larger Georgia Bush? No, because they're very much afraid 
of that of that evil coming from Kremlin. Yes, yes. Besides that, uh, I talked to a couple of days ago, I talked to a friend, I was a guy in Moscow, and I talked to him about attributes, who's in it, but he said, okay, I'm the guy in Moscow, I hate Putin. So should I embrace George W. Bush then? Or if you hate George W. Bush, and I don't like him as well. So should I support Chavez or Castro or you know what I mean? no, no, no one is saying you should support you want you know, Chavez. But that's what you do. No, no, I do not. I, I don't call the that. What I am saying is that we ought not to declare a Cold War II before uh, you know anybody does anything. And well, I mean, who is provoking cruel? Let's look at the empirical facts. We uh, the they are not you can believe that they agree Georgians, Ukrainians, if we just say that they are not. It's kind of you should decide that in Washington, decide that it should be. I am just, look, I am just saying that I don't want to subsidize their defense. And I don't want, uh, uh, I want the U.S. out of NATO. I mean, look, if you, if you want to defend yourselves, fine. If, you can, if Georgia feels that it must have Abkhazia, even though Abkhazia does not want to be part of Georgia, and it must have South Ossetia, even though the South Ossetians don't want to be part of Georgia. I mean, what about secessionism? If Kosovo can be independent, why not South Ossetia? You know, I don't know. Another question, please. Robert, uh, in America, on the heels of Ron Paul's uh, message, Ron Paul went into his message. We have about half a dozen candidates who call themselves Ron Paul Republicans. Do you anywhere in the European scene see Ron Paul candidates emerging? Well, it won't work, no. <laughs> at, least, at least not yet. The difficulty, of course, with Europe is that uh, 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 in America, you have this centralized system with now one person who is aiming at the center, so he is um, a point at which everyone is looking. And uh, we have now the European Union, but it doesn't have this presently. Um, we don't have it yet. But, um, uh, and even if we did, um, we're all we've got 27 different countries with I don't know how many different languages, uh, which makes it much more difficult for some. Such uh, phenomena to emerge, and because um, uh, we are uh, Europe is looking at the American uh, situation, is we're just um, uh, those that are um, uh, convinced by Ron Paul, um, we still are looking for possibilities to express this. Um, but it can't, I, I can't see at the moment that it could be anything. Uh, candidates, at least like when in Germany, not because it's such. Sort of, um, uh, but we, we don't, uh, he, there we have, we have president, but he's not elected directly, so he has to go through the system first, uh, very much more than in America. Um, and the uh, same applies to Britain, uh, similarly, uh, and uh, uh, certainly in, in well, France, they have a direct uh, elector. But, but um, I can't see that emerging in the near future. Uh, there will be different forms of uh, development. Um, I'm sorry I'm speaking so vaguely, but uh, uh, I can't see uh, that's the kind of um, development yet. Yeah. Thank you. 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 So I think uh, we must talk about the situation because maybe you are uh, not very, very well informed about the problems in your region. I think that there are several uh, things coming from HGV, which is what I think of. I mean, I'm not very happy to that, of course. Our institution is not a uh, political institution. We are uh, the impact which works on the economic things and the rest of the others of the for economics. And I don't think that this, uh, what you said are uh, really the uh, real life of uh, the people around the Russian uh, Russia Federation. Maybe we have wrong information. 
Do you have a question? Or is that just no. He wants to announce that he wants to talk to you. Oh, okay. Right. So it's me, me outside. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question? I just, um, with regard to the long before the year, it occurred, it occurred to me when that discussion was going on that it's almost a franchise, it's almost a brand. And if you, regardless of language, uh, if you're almost promoted as a like long before, it's a brand. So, uh, any comments on that? Um, well, it certainly has all the characteristics of a brand. Um, I envision um, um, sort of uh, fra uh, franchise like uh, uh, structures where people work independently um, and decentralized and find their own ways of expression. Which may, in, especially in Europe, be mainly outside the official uh, political sphere, but having a great effect on the political <laughs> sphere by using the websites and blogs to organize events um, that have great public uh, publicity uh, value. And um, so, uh, in, in this way, uh, promoting the brand. Yes. <laughs> Well, I got a long period of question. Yeah, oh, okay. The staying in the US, like the US voter and stuff, yeah. we wouldn't be able to vote for our right? But should we then vote for Mr. Barr? What can we say about him? Barr, the advertising candidate. Well, I, I, I haven't followed him uh, uh, very much. I've been used to fit him. About two or three weeks ago, but I don't know very much about that. I'd rather ask that question to the person. Well, I mean, why you're far? I mean, you're not going to be far, are you? Um, no, I mean, actually, Bob Barr is, is a continuation of the Ron Paul revolution. But again, I mean, Ron Paul really grows because he is such an unlikely icon. I mean, he's modest, it's not all about him. And it's just about ideas. I mean, Bob Barr is much more of a politician type, and he has a long record. I mean, uh, he he was the leader of the uh, of the impeach Clinton campaign in the House of Representatives, and they recall uh, Americans in the audience. And uh, so, I mean, he is not Ron Paul. So you know, I mean. It's not the brand. I mean, it's not the same brand. And I, and I can't see young people going crazy for Bob Barr. Uh, uh, so, um, I mean, it's really too bad that Ron did not run as a third party candidate. Um, but he's getting out in years, and, uh, you know, I think he would want to rest. Uh, but yeah, Bob Barr is great. Um, and if he gets nominated, I think we have a convention. <laughs> Right, yeah, it's going on right now. And who knows what the wackos in the Democratic Party are going to do, um, you know, given their record. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, you know, somebody else can get the nomination. Uh, but, um, I mean, I would support Bob Barr as a private individual. Uh, if anyone else gets it, so yeah, go Bob, go. go. Um, <clears throat> well, <laughs> Question to the leaders. Um, uh, in continuation of, of our question of uh, should we be in NATO and who should be in NATO and should there be, uh, there be an extra alliance, uh, what is your take on the issue? Do you think uh, uh, is it viable to have a uh, defense of or small nations and uh, would they act as a fully and they are all, you know, uh, gather up and try to be like medium sized country or bigger sized country? Of course, I agree that entering NATO means entering some kind of collective defense and actually collective defense states. Actually, uh, what is the base of what is the base of entering NATO is that like constant pressure to increase defense budgets up to 2% GDP, which is still lower than the resistance, <laughs> like, like pressure to increase it, and the increase in taxation. Then we have, of course, our like, mildly pushed 
participate in non NATO but, but, but collective kind of defense actions in Iraq or Bosnia or in, in, in Afghanistan. And you can expose it too. And of course, uh, I'm, I'm against that. But, but on the other hand, you know, there are some circumstances. And you know, it's very understandable that citizens of, of small country, let's say, the city of Estonia, they do not care so much about how to do the American voters are. If you want to invest money or spend money on, on some kind of NATO or whatever security, okay, why not spend on our security? <laughs> of course, it's of course free riding on, on, on your tax, taxpayers' money. But, but you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you are willing to pay this money, I, I do not have to care for this. So it's, it's kind, of, kind of, your, of, your, of your problem. And, and uh, again, maybe I'll already go into a little bit more about this. I completely do not understand what you mean by provocation. Because, because no, there are some, some people and some heads of state which are constantly being provoked, uh, even though the similar actions concerning other people or other heads of state are not being like, as, as provocation. And uh, uh, speaking about like, like this specific. Uh, nice stories about uh, thinking revolutions, which are participated as well, or other kind of revolutions. I very much admire those, but uh, actually, I see that one of the conditions that in order to, to have this kind of revolution successful, you have to have uh, at least some kind of consent with an aggressor. Because in, in, in this case, for example, in this, in this story about uh, from the movie, let's say, about Estonia, uh, part of the story that Jakarta Dyer, who was after he became a president of, of Chechnya, was uh, chief of one of the biggest garnisons in Estonia, and actually he ordered his, his soldiers to stay inside, not, not, not to attack, but of course, sinking peaceful, peaceful people. And in some other cases, again, it was like consent. And the same was like in British uh, and Indian conflict uh, liberation movement, the same was in Nazi Germany, attitude towards Danes or Norwegians or on the citizens of the Netherlands because they achieved it somehow as higher than those citizens of Poland or, or, or the other Russia. And it meant that so the Danish, Danish people were able to be to, to, to involved successfully in peaceful environment. But it depended very much on, on the attitude of them. And so the best is, is very nice, nice, but it doesn't work, of course. And what last remark is that we have to be very cautious when speaking about collective security or national security because all these concepts, collective security, national security, centralized security, planned security, tax finance security, all of these all are quite different concepts. And a kind of collective security, when I agree with my neighbor to protect each other, or we agree to pay a defense agents, it's also a kind of collective security. That's nothing wrong with it. We have to look at other, other aspects of all this. So, so collective security as such is it doesn't mean centralized security or tax pairs, money finance security. So these are completely different things. If I can just answer that. Um, uh, if you want to know what the provocation is, it's called a missile defense shield, which means that uh, now in Czechoslovakia, Poland, and throughout Eastern Europe, uh, there is a system in place which would enable the West to conduct a nuclear first strike on Russia. So they consider that, well, let me finish, they consider that a provocation, and they feel endangered, especially in the context of the warmongering rhetoric, an anti-Russian rhetoric coming out of the White House and many you know, uh, 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 you know media outlets. Um, and as far as uh, you know, this whole idea of collective security, I would refer you to Mark Rothbard on the on the evils of collective security. Uh, and his argument, very briefly, was that uh, this spreads conflict, that it happens these you know all these alliances uh, that. Uh, what started out as brush fire may turn into a will turn into a conflagration and a world war. In fact, that's how World War One started. Uh, uh, and no one was advocating. Uh, uh, and finally, I, you know, I just want to say that uh, I know you don't care whether you're oppressing U.S. taxpayers, but I know that the internationalism is not reciprocal. So you want us to protect you, but you don't care if we're oppressed by our state. I mean, that is a, I don't know, I, it, it doesn't seem right. <laughs>
Peter? Or whatever the problem. Did you have a problem? No, no, no. Oh, I, 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 <clears throat> Thanks. I actually wanted to uh, uh, come back to uh, Remedius' uh, uh, remarks a little bit and also some things that the there's going to be a Yuri and Justin show here. Uh, that, uh, it seems to me that there that there was actually uh, an attempt between the wars, uh, at least a couple of attempts, at collective security among the small states. There was the Little Entente, there was the Balkan Pact, and there was one, at least one other uh, similar kind of agreement. And of course, they they were they failed ultimately to protect the, uh, the international uh, uh, independence of those states. And I think the reason that they failed, the reason that these kinds of uh, arrangements have, uh, that failed in the past is something that uh, Remigius uh, hit upon at the very end of his remarks. Unfortunately, uh, you only mentioned this briefly, but I think this is really the key. And that is, is, uh, is free trade and investment. That uh, the thing that was lacking in the interwar period, the reason why, in, in my opinion, anyway, the reason why these uh, tensions of security among the small states ultimately failed because they weren't matched. Uh, sorry, the military agreements, the military cooperation, such as it was between the different uh, successor states of the Habsburg and Ottoman empires, wasn't uh, and Roman empires wasn't matched by similar uh, 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 economic integration uh, between those states. And one of the things that you posited that I thought was could be a very fruitful line of inquiry is uh, whether or not ultimately the only real defense of a small country against a larger neighbor or uh, uh, imperial, uh, imperial minded uh, um, threat is uh, is to encourage investment by it, uh, to make it to make it in the material best interest of that country not to not to not to attack um, a, a small country like Estonia or Lithuania or, or what have you. Now, my question though is that this sounds to me. I mean, I'm very attracted to this to this proposition. Um, but I'm wondering if uh, the flip side of this is that, uh, historically anyway, nationalists have always regarded foreign investment not as some kind of benign way of, of fostering cooperation. They regarded foreign investment as bullying. Now, uh, what I'm wondering, I guess my question to you is, uh, given this both empirically and theoretically, what do you think uh, in your, uh, in the, uh, the case of Baltic uh, states, which uh, I imagine you're most uh, most familiar with, but you can expect this out of other areas that uh, you may have, ex uh, which may have experienced. But I'm just curious, to what degree do you think uh, the climate for this really exists currently in the point it's foreign? Saying that Russia should uh, be interested in uh, investing money um, in the point do you think that most uh, uh, the the general perception of that investment would be as yet another? Uh, kind of Russian ruling, or do you think that it would be well in this way of uh, 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 fostering some sort of peaceful uh, uh, relations with, uh, with Russia? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I also think that this is one of the main points I want to stress, uh, but I would say that this is not acceptable to the majority of the population to think that, uh, unfortunately. And, uh, as you just did some, some examples of the NFL, have, have one good one example. We have a huge uh, oil refinery factory, which is connected with the Druzhba or French pipeline with, with Russia, which supplies oil. And this, this uh, refinery was twice sold to foreign investors. And uh, because, first, first, first of all, it was sold to, to an American company with, with huge pressure, pressure from, from, from the US embassy and so on. And it was like a slogan that you know, not let Ivan to the pipe. Well, what so it, we will not let Ivan to the pipe. Ivan means like a symbol of, of, of Russian, yeah. Russian investors. And actually, it actually meant what we personally from Lukoil. And actually, the, the idea was that if we will let Lukoil into the factory, it would mean that we would be like some kind of pocket of, of, of Russia. And in fact, uh, as the company was sold to, to Americans, of course, we just not happened. The the the, the Europe pipeline that was under construction in in, in the for like four months and it was closed and it was not 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 uh, economically efficient enough to transport oil to other regions and it means that, that this Williams company in this case has to sold sold the company again the Russian company Europe 
which was like, okay, because you did this better version of it than the boy. But afterwards, with some kind of, of like legal maneuvers, when, when, when leaders of Ubers were like, like uh, the leaders of national health, actually, the Ukrainian government was, was able, by Russian, the Ukrainian government was able to buy it out and resell again. In this case, again, the Polish Polish company, Orman, which is actually a state controlled company. And what we have again, we have again, like, problem with supply of pure to the, to the to the factory. And in fact, it's a very good illustration how big powers of any powers react. If you dismiss, if you don't let them in, of course, then they have all the other, other means to implement their policies. And if you could imagine that, you know, Russian company would, would be a man for this, this we find that here now, I'm sure there will be no, no such problems. I'm not 100% enthusiastic about this, it doesn't solve all problems, because in case of World War II, for example, if you have a bullying neighbor which is completely crazy, you know, it doesn't care about private investments and then any kind of investment, of course, it, it doesn't care. But in most cases, it, I guess it's very helpful. And the case of Switzerland also is kind of in this case. Hey, Atush. Remigius, uh, in general, uh, and let's be practical, what do you think about your country's foreign policy? What do you like about it, or would you change anything dramatically? Yeah. You know, it's not bad. The Ukrainians are a little bit uh, like wanting to operate fast and have influence with Ukraine, but when actually it was Moscow was once under the control of the Ukrainian troops. It's a more also Together with both, but that's not all. But, uh, and then this actually, I mean, this is kind of, of national, not pride, but, but the, the, the more strong inside, even to resist, to resist the Soviet invasion after World War II. So that's, I think that was one of the reasons why the resistance was even more active in this area than in the historians, in my opinion, what it is. But uh, now it plays a very limited role because it's really tries to negotiate and act uh, in every kind of orange or from the revolution, like in, in Ukraine, or try to be negotiated in case of, of, of Georgia, whatever. I think this is completely wrong because uh, I think it's very impractical, Spanish still approach and you get involved in the quarrels. And I think that that's wrong. But what I think is, is, is very good is just to tell the truth, to base foreign policy on truth. And for example, now at the ANA, the only machine in EU, which is vetoing EU negotiations with Russia on several several grounds, including uh, including uh, Russia's nuclear actions in, in Caucasus, including uh, like uh, denying to 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 to, uh, uh, to, to send to Lithuania those those people who, who were involved in killings of innocent people during the nineties. And including some other other aspects. And uh, as you know, all the states, all you know, Estonia, Lithuania, and, and, and Poland most, where those states who made some severe comments concerning uh, the 50th anniversary of uh, the, the end of World War II, or big uh, uh, nation, national war, as the Russia was. Uh, and when they said that, you know, some countries, the World War II didn't finish with the main nine. And then you know that we were still occupied. So telling this, these truths, I think, is very crucial. And I think that many people have to understand that you know, if, if you go to a major cities in, in, in Russia, the main the streets of the city are still named communist streets, Latin street, and the civil street. And you know, communist killers are, I mean, they, they have monument there. That Stalin is one of our ancestors, you know, one of the most of figures in Russia. And you know, it is one of my right in the neighborhoods of suspension. I have a most question to Justin and then Robert regarding the Rockpool uh, movement future. Uh, what do you see? What's, what's going to happen next? Um, uh, this is, I mean, very unlikely that Trump will get a nomination of the Republican Party. He has to book out uh, about the, the information will come and uh, he might to speak there or not, or how do you see this uh, going forward in, in, in many year, especially not that long like until the president relations? Well, you know, the Ron Paul people are very well organized, they are very dedicated, and they're very active in the local party organizations. 
in Kansas, in Texas, in Oklahoma, in Montana, and in a few other states. I mean, they are causing plenty of trouble for the GOP establishment. So what they have is what the Trotskyists used to call the entryist strategy. <laughs> that is, you enter a large organization that has some views that are compatible with your own. And you enter and you organize inside, and uh, you try to recruit in that way. Uh, and that's, that's what they're doing. I mean, even in San Francisco, I had uh, the Ron Paul people are running a full slate of candidates for county central committee. So, I mean, this is a long, patient, boring from within. I, it's just like in uh, Great Britain, uh, on the left, you have the militant tendency in Trotsky, I group, which practically took over the Labour Party in, I believe, the 1980s or the late, late 1980s. Uh, and uh, so, and I think, well, watch on TV for the platform fight over foreign policy, uh, right on the floor of the Republican and National Convention. We have delegates. Uh, you know, I think they I think they have like 55 delegates uh, to the, you know, National Convention, and they can get up and they can speak and they can make motions and they will. Um, so it's going to be very, but it's a long-term thing. I mean, you know, you have to build a, a national network of local organizations that do the very patient, boring from within, and educational work that needs to be done. And you know, Ron Paul's biggest trial may be that he had a book that was number one on the New York Times bestsellers. So, you know, his book is being read by millions of people and it's being pushed and Ideas rule the world. So if they do, and we have the best ones, maybe we're going to after all. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. In addition to that, um, the long term, it's a long term project, and the chances of it succeeding are fairly good. The majority of people who are involved and dedicated are pretty young. Yeah, sort of teenagers, thirties. Uh, uh, is a huge majority in Europe as well. Um, so uh, we can't say yet what is it, what's going to happen in a year or so, which is short term still, uh, so, but we can say that it's going to that it's going to stay. These people are mentally out of the system. They're not going to go back in. Uh, they're, and they're staying out and they're doing that educational thing because they like to do it. It's like it's Wikipedia. It's the thing. Write about what you, you like, and uh, people learn from that. Hey, Ralph, we're going to five o'clock. <laughs>